Good evening. I'm Jody Schneider. I'm president of the Foreign Correspondence Club and an editor at Bloomberg. I'm very pleased uh, tonight to welcome you to a very special event, an exclusive Zoom conversation with Gary Kasparov, who is a, uh, obviously a chess legend and now a democracy crusader. This is part of a series of Zoom events open to members and guests. Uh, and in recent months, we've broadcast uh, a number of these events, and they come out over YouTube and on the FCC website after the event. Uh, a reminder that FCC membership does have its benefits. Members can ask questions, so please send along these via the chat function, and we'll try to get to as many questions tonight as possible. Um, you'll be able to see this afterwards, so if you've enjoyed it, please pass along the word to your family and friends. We have a few upcoming events. Uh, on Monday, we will have uh, Admiral Bill Owens, the former Vice Chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff. And we will be having on September 8th, uh, Brian Stelter from uh, CNN, who's just written a book about Fox News, Trump, and the dangerous distortion of the truth. So sign up for those as well. I'd now like to introduce you. It gives me my great pleasure to introduce our speaker who will be in conversation with our own Eric Wishart of AFP and the first vice president of the FCC. Gary Kasparov is a Russian chess master, former world chess champion, writer, and political activist. In 1985, at the age of 22, he became the youngest world chess champion in history. He is leading voice on human rights and in 2012 was named chairman of the New York-based Human Rights Foundation. And in 2016, he was named a security ambassador by Avest Software, where he discusses cybersecurity and the digital future. Uh, in 2017, he founded the Renew Democracy Initiative, dedicated to promoting the principles of the free world. Uh, Eric will be discussing with him the upcoming U.S. election, the geopolitical stakes of that election, his opposition to Russian President Vladimir Putin, how he views China's worldview in the political situation in Hong Kong, his thoughts on artificial intelligence, and of course, chess. I give you Eric Wishart and Gary Kasparov. Thank you. Thank you, Dodi, and welcome, Gary, from Croatia, I think. Yep, thank you. That's a nice sea view. So, I would just like to thank you and welcome to everybody who's joining us tonight. And um, I'd like to open with a kind of a broad question about your work on democracy. You, Jody, referred in the introduction to the, the New Democracy Initiative, and I think you're also the chairman of the Human Rights Foundation. So could you maybe just give us a, an overview of your, of your work uh, to promote democracy? Um. I was involved in uh, uh, fighting for democracy from uh, the late 80s as the young world champion. I thought it was my uh, duty uh, to help uh, my compatriots in the Soviet Union uh, to um, get together, join forces fighting against communism. Um, I had no political aspirations at the time and um, all I thought that uh, you know, by not doing that, I could send the wrong message because I was obviously protected by my uh, newfound fame and uh, my voice you know, could resonate with millions and millions of people in the Soviet Union. Um, and uh, I was fairly active uh, uh, for a few years um, before the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. And then I, um, I moved away playing chess and doing other things uh, because I was under the impression, as many of us in 91, 92, that that was some kind of the end of history. If we all remember the, 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 the best-selling book of Francis Fukuyama uh, released in 1992. We thought that um, to a certain point, history came to an end. Communism was defeated. Uh, democracy was on the rise. Of course, there were some you know, unpleasant um, episodes of this fight like Tiananmen Square. I apologize for saying episode, but just you know, in a big picture, it looked like, um, like uh, an aberration because the, most of the communist dictatorships collapsed and then the, the right-wing dictatorships followed uh, um, the same, the same um, pattern. Uh, but we made a mistake because uh, we didn't want to recognize one of the most important lessons of history that evil doesn't disappear, it doesn't die. It uh, can be buried under the rubbles of Berlin Wall for a while. But the moment we lose our vigilance, the moment we turn to be complacent, it sprawls out. 
And um, that's what we saw in Russia. And um, uh, it was quite shocking for me and uh, many of my friends to see the rise of the KGB Lieutenant Colonel um, uh, taking over uh, 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 Russian presidency uh, in less than nine years after um, uh, the uh, monument of the founder of KGB, Felix Dzerzhinsky, was removed from the Bank of Square in Moscow after these jubilant days of August 1991. Uh, so um, it, it was not just uh, Vladimir Putin being a KGB officer, but for my trained ear, you know, it was enough to hear him saying that once KGB is always KGB, it's quote unquote. Uh, he lamented the collapse of the Soviet Union as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. And his first action as, as the Russian president was to restore Soviet anthem. People say it's all symbolic, but Russia is country of symbols. And uh, these symbolic gestures told me and uh, quite a few of us that um, Russia was on the wrong path again. And um, while I, you know, I was still playing chess, I already knew that I would have to end my career by moving uh, back to real politics, fighting um, uh, rising KGB dictatorship. And I did it in 2005, though I always prefer to call it f fight for democracy and human rights, because again, it was not about winning elections. It was a fight for having elections. Um, it's, uh, it's probably similar to what's happening now in Hong Kong. Though in Hong Kong, I have to say that they experienced some fruits of victories because they could have won elections. In Putin's Russia, it was, it was not the case. So we simply couldn't make it in, into the ballot as I tried in 2008 in the presidential elections to put my name on the ballot and I failed because they had so many obstacles and, uh, and it was impossible even for, for a person of my fame and my resources to, to, to get through this um, uh, uh, network of, uh, of obstacles uh, created, created by the regime. Um, and uh, while fighting in Russia as, as, as a member of the broad coalition of democratic forces, I also uh, thought that it would be important to utilize my uh, global notoriety to help uh, uh, people fighting for freedom in other countries. And um, I um, joined the board of Human Rights Foundation at a time when Václav Havel, uh, one of my great heroes, was, was a chairman of the board. And when he passed away, uh, I will, uh, the, the board suggested that I would take over. And it's, you know, I, I thought it was a great honor. And since 2012, I, I'm chairman of Human Rights Foundation that is, um, is known for organizing the largest gathering of dissidents uh, in the world in Oslo. It's called Oslo Freedom Forum. And uh, we have been spreading um, um, this event around the world. It's not just Oslo, though it's our main event, but it's also two places in New York, uh, in, in, in Taipei, in Johannesburg, in uh, Mexico uh, City. And um, it's, um, it's, it's an event that features dissidents uh, or um, those who represent them if, if our heroes are behind, uh, behind bars or even worse, um, to telling this, the real, real stories uh, about, about this fight. And the, another organization that was uh, mentioned by Judy briefly, Renew Democracy Initiative, it was more of American breed organization. It, it uh, was created in 2017. Uh, I did it with some of my friends, um, moderate Democrats in New York City and uh, the group that I um, uh, joked uh, calling them the, the uh, refugees from the Wall Street Journal. So some of the principles Republicans who didn't uh, want to accept Trump's ascendance and Trump's take, take, take over of Republican Party. Um, and it grew up to, to, to a very um, formidable force and, 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 a, and a strong voice supporting democracy uh, and, and fighting ex extremes on both sides, both on the right and on the left. Um, because we believe that uh, democracy in the world, whether it's America or Europe, is now under siege. And you have uh, nativists, uh, right-wing uh, nationalists on one side, attacking the, um, uh, the uh, liberal um, democracy, this, the, um, the, these institutions. Uh, and on the other side, you have the far left extremists attacking market economy. So two pillars of the free world, liberal democracy and market economy are, are attacks from both sides. And we know from history that uh, when, when you see this, the rise of the two radical forces on, uh, this, on, the, the, on the fringes, 
uh, that's when, when democracy is in, is in real danger. Few people rem uh, remember that Adolf Hitler never won elections in Germany in 1932. The best results of, of his party was 37.2%, if, if I'm not wrong. But at the same elections, communists made 16. And when you, when you combine, you see the danger. That's the more than half of the German voters rejected democracy. And it was just a matter of time uh, before one of the, one of the extreme forces uh, uh, could succeed in destroying um, democratic institutions. It's not that you know, America is, 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 is there or Europe, but the fact is that in many countries we see the trend, like in Germany, the rise of AFD on the right and Die Linke on the left. In France, Mélenchon on the left and Le Pen on the right. We also saw the Brexiteers in the UK versus uh, Jeremy Corbyn's uh, um, socialist labor at the time. And of course in America, when just in 2016, we saw the rise of Trump and Bernie Sanders on the other side. So it's, and uh, um, um, today, just you know, just uh, wrapping up my you know, presentation. So the uh, RDI has a very uh, representative board that includes two former senators, uh, Democrats, uh, uh, former senators um, Heidi Heitkamp from uh, North Dakota and Bob Carey from Nebraska, and we have two prominent uh, former members of the Republican Party: the uh, former head of RNC, Michael Steele, and a former member of the House, a very prominent um, voice. Um, for political reform, uh, Mickey Edwards. Uh, and a uh, few other people um, just from both sides who helped to create this, um, this um, um, uh, entity that is just, it's, it's not only limited its work to America, though American election, of course, American political system is in the center of our attention. But uh, our um, advisory board includes uh, members from, um, from uh, uh, different countries and our manifesto that you can find on rdi.org has been signed by uh, people you know, from all, all um, political corners ranging from Jose Maria Aznar to, 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 uh, to um, uh, uh, Stephen Fry. So how would you sum up the state of democracy or the threat to democracy in America? I mean, Barack Obama made a very powerful statement about that last week. What are the stakes? And in the upcoming election in the United States? Um, it's, it's a long story, you know, and it's just, you know, we, we just have to understand that Donald Trump uh, is more like a symptom. It's not a disease. The fact is that Donald Trump could, could win nomination and eventually become president was a clear demonstration that something was dead wrong in the system. Um, and uh, it's, it's easy to, sh to, to, to put all the blame on Trump and his administration, but we should look, you know, backward. You know, I, as a professional chess player, I used to analyze the games and to, to recognize my own mistakes that led to the calamity uh, of, of, the, of the current position. And um, we have to say that, you know, one of the negative trends was accumulation of more executive power in the presidential hands at the expense of, of legislative brand. And, uh, um, of the government branch of the branch of the government, and uh, uh, Barack Obama also could be blamed for that, that. As George W. Bush or Bill Clinton, we saw that since Watergate, there was a shift of, of power, you know, from um, uh, legislative branch into the into the uh, Oval Office. But also, um, it's the there, there were many challenges that that um, American um, American leadership, you know, decided not to not to respond adequately and, and on, in time. Um, and uh, it always happens when you have a problem that is being neglected by the mainstream political parties, you will have populists, whether from the right or from the left, uh, taking advantage of that, benefiting from uh, political elite being uh, numb and just you know, not, you know, not talking about these issues. And of course, you know, they come up with solutions that look easy on paper, but of, but of course you cannot, you know, uh, um, incorporate them without uh, tremendous damage to the democratic institutions. What is happening now, it's quite unique in America. And I'm, you know, I'm, I've been observing US presidential elections for uh, more than 30 years. So the first time I uh, paid attention, um, uh, close attention was in 1988 when I, wasn't, I, I, I had a chance to travel to the States. But since uh, the 70s, you know, I, as a kid, you know, I was always following uh, information that I could collect from um, from the so from the Soviet sources, and that's why I, I know I uh, I think I could just you know um, um, say that 
what's happening today, uh, you know, nobody could have predicted it before. So many Republicans, prominent Republicans, supporting the candidate from the other party because they put uh, country over the party. Uh, and, uh, and just to imagine that uh, uh, most of the Republicans, as we saw in the Senate, would ignore an obvious violation of constitutional norms uh, and defend Trump, shield him against impeachment was also hard to imagine. Um, and it's not about uh, the choice, not just between Biden and Trump. Biden would not be my first choice, you know, um, uh, except this, 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 this elections. Um, I remember when in 2016, um, I was uh, uh, and at, at, uh, on, on, on one of the programs on Fox, Fox News. At, at, at that time, you know, it's just, yes, I thought I could, I could go, go there, you know, without any, any damage to my reputation. And uh, uh, the, the, the presenter uh, asked me with, you know, with, uh, with some kind of, you know, uh, uh, amusement in, in, in her voice, are you seriously for Hillary? And I said, no, I'm not for Hillary, I'm for sanity. And, um, and I think now we are not for Biden, we are for restoring constitutional order. It doesn't mean that, you know, the Biden's election will solve American problems, but it's, 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 the, it's, the, uh, it's, it's a reverse. If he doesn't win, American democracy will be great danger. It's not just democracy in the United States, but the whole world, free world, will be in danger because Trump in 2016 succeeded in, in, um, in receiving approval of his political style uh, from American uh, public. Re-election means that his political practice, his actions will be approved. And uh, if you look at what's happening in America and the way Trump has been treating American alliances and, and international relations, I think the, it's, it's not just the damage that we could expect. I mean, we could expect the total uh, um, disaster uh, of the world order that we, uh, we, we, we knew since the, world of, the end of the World War II. Uh, you just mentioned Fox News, Brian Stelter, who's interviewed you and who's going to be speaking to the FCC on September the 8th, has just produced the, his book about the relationship between Trump and Fox. Um, you know, people talk about Fox News as propaganda, um, the role of Sean Hannity, um, Tucker Carlson. I mean, from your experience, are these valid comparisons, for example, I mean, how would you compare the influence of Fox News to the, the kind of influence that state-controlled media had in the USSR or the media has in Vladimir Putin's Russia? Are these valid comparisons or how would you analyze the impact it has? No, I don't think it's a valid comparison for a simple reason. Uh, in the Soviet Union or in, in Putin's Russia, you know, you can switch from one channel to another and it will be the same propaganda machine. <laughs> Different faces, but the same message. You know, like Fox, you can watch CNN, you can watch MSNBC. I mean, you have many choices. So America is still a free country. So that's why let's not, you know, let's not overdo it by, you know, by bringing, you know, the parallels from communism, from yeah. fascism. And also, let me tell you again, now I just, you know, with what these days, I start my morning having CNN and Fox, two screens, just looking at the news, because I have to say that Fox is, is during the last couple of months, you know, just, you know, try to, to sort of to amend its, its hatred. And it's, it's not Hannity and Tucker Carlson only. It just, you know, you have other messages. And what bothers me greatly, when you look at the CNN front page and Fox front page, uh, you do not recognize that they're talking about the same country. If there is no Trump news, which both, both um, uh, uh, media covers, then it's as if they're talking about two different countries. They just, they, it's not that you know, they're lying, it's a simply pick up different stories. It's, and uh, I think it's, it shows that the country is in, is in great trouble because it's, you, know, you, you have this division between red and blue and, uh, and it's, you know, it's, the, fighting against each other is not a solution. It's not some sort of the hybrid, uh, a cold civil war. And um, it's very important that uh, the, the division that is just, you know, that's, that's one of the um, greatest arts that Trump, you know, is spreading around, so how to divide people, how to make them attacking each other. So it's very important to go beyond that and just to look for, for solution that could incorporate people in the middle and just, you know, 
help them to fight against extremes. Because right now we could see, you know, it, it, the, um, the most radical views uh, dominating uh, uh, on, on Twitter from both sides. Yes, you have, of course, you know, that's the, the Tucker Carlson, the nativist uh, uh, views. But you also have, you know, the Bernie Bros. And this is uh, some of the things they're saying, they're just, I, I reject completely because I hear socialism. And, and it's also, also interesting, people who are today in America fighting for human rights and they're just pointing out that the ills of uh, modern America and also the sins of America in the past, they somehow turn the blind eye to genocide in Xinjiang. They don't care about Hong Kong. They don't care about Maduro's uh, a drug, drug dictatorship. They pretend that Putin is not, is not the, uh, 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 the problem as big as, 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 as it is. So um, that's why I think it's important that America, uh, it's not just you know, kicking out Trump, but also America will offer a new vision for the world. America will restore its global leadership and, uh, and will try to sort of to bring together people in the middle. It's, it's like it's protecting the middle that has been decimated by the radicals on both sides. I think it's the number one priority and hopefully Biden administration will be up to the task. What do you think of the state of the discourse, if I can say that, in the United States? I mean, Trump essentially gave his blessing to QAnon last week. Um, he was asked a direct question about what did he think of QAnon? And he said, I've heard that, that it is gaining in popularity. These are people that love our country. And there was also the, the white coat uh, doctors on the, on the um, steps of the Supreme Court, which went viral. So, um, and I remember that you, you actually, I remember an interview you did with Brian Stelton, yep. CNN, where you said that um, it used to be here from both sides, from Democrats and Republicans, from conservatives and liberals. Now it is simple, it is truth versus lies. I'm, I'm quoting your words yep. back to you. Uh, what should be done is keeping repeating the facts, stop giving equal time to lies. And of course, Kellyanne Conway is leaving and she invented the term alternative facts. So, what, 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 you know, is this election, is the pandemic, is it, is it discussion, are the decisions people taking rooted in reality or is it rooted in, in this, whatever alternative? Uh, now, you, you use the word reality. And what is reality, especially at the time of pandemics, when just, you know, the reality is what you see on the screen. So that's why it's very often it's about interpretation of the facts. And, uh, uh, and the way these facts are being you know, presented to you somehow be becomes reality in your mind. And if enough people believe in it, you have to say it's a reality because it's a political factor. And political factor, it's a very powerful weapon in the hands of Donald Trump or his equivalents on the far left. So um, it's, it's, it's a big challenge for us because there's only one way to tell the truth and so many ways to lie, especially in the era of social media when you have unlimited number of channels to communicate your lies. Um, and also uh, all the studies show that it's about 70 30 split. 70% 70 of, of, uh, of um, fake news, they, 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 they always being found more attractive by general public because they come up with some sort of sensational element, something that people didn't know. It's again, it's probably human nature. Um, I don't see it as a simple solution for that because it's, you know, we, we're no longer at a time where, you know, you have three uh, main TV channels like NBC, uh, ABC, CBS. It's not just, you know, two big uh, cables like CNN or Fox. We're talking about, you know, uh, about an era where anyone, literally anyone on the planet could actually create his or her uh, um, uh, uh, virtual stronghold and to address followers and uh, with, with some luck, uh, these these uh, um, new um, uh, new strongholds uh, could generate uh, tons of lies and then spread uh, misinformation. And of course, you know, uh, the moment politicians like Trump could sniff the the um, uh, the smell of success, so they will immediately grab it. Trump doesn't care about uh, about uh, uh, QAnon. I even probably, you know, I would probably go as far as saying I don't even think Trump is racist. You know, because racist means that he cares about someone. He doesn't care about anybody. 
you know, just he's racist because it's convenient to him. So this is, I think he looks at people, you know, if they can bring him votes and victory, fine, he's there. So it's, this is, it's even worse because you cannot even put him, you know, in one box. So, you know, he clearly, this is a racist. I mean, George Walls was a racist. You know exactly what he pushed you. Trump, you know, he's just seeking he wear any hat. So that's, by the way, that's, that's, that's what I always said about Vladimir Putin. That, you know, he, he, could, he could pretend to be a liberal economy. He could be, pretend to be a nationalist. Uh, he could uh, come up with any populist messages. At the end of the day, it's a mafia rule. So, and uh, in, in Russia, because it's all about staying in power and making, making money. And Trump, somehow, it's, just, it's, 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 it's of similar type. That's why Trump envies dictators. Uh, because they can do whatever they want. They can just, you know, they, they are not limited by public control, by media, by uh, state institutions. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it, it makes him even far more dangerous than someone with a strong views that are rejected by, by our society, because we know exactly where this person is. With Trump, you look at the Republican National Convention. You know, you, you, if you bring, let's say again, you hear... Uh, Tim Scott or Nikki Haley, uh, and you hear uh, Eric Trump. This is not the same party. I mean, they, they, they talk about things that, you know, that don't belong to, 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 to the same tent. Um, and uh, that's, that's how Trump benefits. You know, he's, it's, it's, uh, it's almost, uh, you know, it's a rubber entity. You know, he can, you know, stretch it one way or another, you know, as, 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 as long as he believes it, it could bring him uh, in immediate benefits because it's all about what helps me today. And that's what also Trump succeeded. And that's again, another sign of classical dictatorship. The truth is what the, the party or the deal leader says today, because tomorrow it could shift and you have to adjust. I want to um, move the discussion towards Hong Kong. And I'd like to do it by just asking you a bit about your upbringing. You, you were born in um, Baku in Azerbaijan. You're Armenian, Jewish. Yep. Uh, and, I mean, uh, Jewish. and you um, see and winter is coming that you joined the Communist Party. You weren't proud of it, but you did it because of this. Uh, what look, it was. I, I was, I was, I was yeah. not a freedom fighter at the time. I wanted to be the world champion. Yeah. And the rule was very simple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. By the way, it didn't save me from, you know, from uh, uh, attacks by the Soviet sport authorities because they clearly yes. preferred ethnic Russian Anatoly Karp, who was a good, good party soldier. And I, even with, uh, with the, uh, mem my membership of the Communist Party, I uh, showed clear, si clear sign of rebellion since uh, early mm -hmm. days. And in 1985, uh, um, just before my second match with Karpov, when I took my title, uh, the title from him, uh, I had an interview with German magazine Der Spiegel, and that was like you know just you know uh, a bomb went as a bomb in Moscow because first time the Soviet uh, Soviet athlete and of course in the Soviet Union uh, chess, chess players were, uh, were athletes um, uh, um, went publicly against uh, Soviet th sport authorities and no less than in Western press. And then you left the Communist Party in 1990. Yeah, in, in general, I, I read, I, way, I read, way before the collapse of the Soviet Union. Yeah, I've read, um, I've read Winter is Coming. So, um, now, if you look at what happened to Boris Nemtsov, you yourself, are, I mean, it, it was reminiscent of what happens in Hong Kong. You, I, I, I've seen the footage of you being thrown in the back of that police van. Alexei Navalny's just been poisoned. Yep. Um, yep. How much of a threat is there to opponents of Vladimir Putin, including yourself? Do you feel it threat? Well, would you go well, back to Would you go back to Russia while he is president? Of course, uh, no. Uh, I will not. But I, I please, you know, just don't call him president. You know, it's uh, uh, it's <laughs> it's he's, he is what he is—a dictator. Vladimir okay. Putin is a dictator for life, and calling him president, you know, uh, gives him some legitimacy that that he he needs so badly. Um, I left uh, Russia in February 2013 after being asked to uh, appear in the Russian Investigative Committee when, uh, uh, when they opened a case, a political case that ended in, uh, ended in a big trial. Uh, and Boris, late Boris Nemtsov advised me not to come back because I was traveling abroad, saying, you know, if, 
if you if you enter this building and you're being interrogated and if you leave the building if you leave the building you will not be a, a witness you'll be a suspect it's a it's a, it's very tragic that boris Nemtsov was too proud to leave russia he was mm -hmm. a former deputy prime minister we can only dream of russia if uh, boris yeltsin would have chosen him as a successor um uh, and he believed he had to stay and fight back and we know what you know what's happened to him he ended up with five bullets uh, in his back um, in February two, uh, 2015. And now you mentioned Alexei Navalny. Uh, it, it was a clear attempt to murder him. Uh, it's not a surprise that German doctors revealed that the substance that was used to, to kill Navalny has been used um, um, in, in, in a few other instances. Um, uh, it's the same group as the, as the um, famous Novichok, the, the, uh, the, the chemicals that have been used to, to, to um, uh, poison Skripals in the in the UK. Probably it all comes from the same KGB lab, and uh, it was it was a miracle that Navalny is still alive because it's his guarding angel angel was a pilot. The pilot decided to have an urge, uh, emergency landing in Omsk. Tomsk, Moscow is about four hours flight. In Omsk, they landed in one hour, and it it saved Navalny's life. And just to tell you, you know how much they wanted to kill him. The moment the 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 the, the, uh, the uh, pilot asked for emergency landing. Somebody, somebody called Omsk Airport, God forbid Omsk Airport, uh, telling that the airport had, had a bomb and had to be closed. But again, some people on the ground, they didn't buy it, so they let the, the, the plane to land. And another miracle that uh, the, the local doctor, you know, from emergency room, you know, he, he picked up the right, uh, right medicine, atropine. And, uh, and that's, that's what saved Navalny's life. And then the pressure on Putin was unbearable. So he got a call from everyone, everybody, except Donald Trump. By the way, that's yes. important. This is, it's, it's amazing that it's the first time in my memory, Americans were way behind Europeans in even saying anything about, you know, such, uh, 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 it's not a murder, but such a, uh, um, a, a case of, of an attempted murder of a prominent uh, uh, opposition politician uh, in, in, in Russia or in, in, in any other country. Um, and, uh, and they let him go, uh, and the German doctors actually discovered the, 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 the traces of, the, of, this, um, uh, uh, of this poison. And uh, we still don't know if Navalny, um, he, he definitely survives, but we still don't know whether he will be fully capable of operating because it could, it, the, the poison and the, the consequences could, uh, could uh, have a terrible impact on his uh, central nerve system and uh, God forbid on his brains. I want to come back to Hong Kong, but I mean, since we, since you, 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 you mentioned the Donald Trump, Putin connection, um, what is going on? What's, I mean, I mean, I saw Pompeo saying, well, you know, we'll condemn it. We're, you know, if, if the poisoning is confirmed, very lukewarm. Um, we know that Trump has been dodging the discussion about the Russian bounties in Afghanistan. I mean, just, you, you know, the general, what is, what's the relationship? Why, I mean, I, I mean, I know that, I mean, having read um, Winter is Coming, you were very critical of the American under Clinton, the fact that they betrayed, they didn't respect the, the agreement with Ukraine when it denuclearized, when the Russians invaded Ukraine. And, and annex Crimea. So, very simplistic question, but what's going on between Trump and Putin in the United States and Russia? I hope we'll find out more with Biden administration when uh, we can, we'll have a chance to look at the Trump taxes and other, other uh, uh, links to, uh, to Russian intelligence or uh, um, Russian oligarchs. I, I, it's my educated guess. I think that the Trump's connections to Russians would, uh, what, what, we, what we'll find out, uh, um, started much earlier than in just 2008, 2009, when, when Russian money saved, saved his crumbling empire from, uh, um, um, from collapse. Um, I will not be surprised if we find these, the, these, these links going as far as the 90s. Okay. Um, um, and, uh, now, without even uh, just without even uh, uh, just you know analyzing the facts because we don't have you know uh, full access to to this to these uh, materials and documents, look you know uh, let's you know be devil's advocate you know if Trump you know uh, 
were Russian uh, agent, Russian, um, and Putin's his hand there. What Trump would do differently? Because everything he did benefited Putin. So this is, uh, he always, you know, looked for an excuse to let Putin off the hook. And now uh, what could be a clear signal of America's, you know, of America's um, uh, refusal to fulfill its commitment by, uh, for NATO by uh, ordering the removal of 12,000 US troops from Germany. It's, it, sometimes Trump, Trump talks about uh, cost, but that's very costly. This is, it's, it's why America is investing uh, uh, so much money in, in relocating these troops and, and weakening Europe, and obviously sending a message to Putin that America no interest in defending Europe against potential Russian aggression. And I have no doubt that if Trump su survives politically, if he is reelected, uh, then I think the Baltic states might be in great danger because yep. Putin would, uh, would, uh, would not be stopped un unless he understands that there will be a devastating response from NATO and NATO without America cannot do it. So um, it's, you know, we, we also, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll learn more about Trump-Putin clandestine relations uh, by hopefully by getting access to, to uh, the transcripts of their conversations. Though many of them as, uh, as these conversations have been recorded only by, by, by Russians, not by Americans. Uh, I am under the impression that Trump spent more time with Putin on the telephone or personally than with any other leader of, of a major country. Uh, going again, back to, going back to the Soviet era, do you think Putin looks at Trump as a useful idiot? You know, it's the... Um, um, I met enough KGB colonels and lieutenant colonels to actually read their faces. And uh, I can tell you that the way Putin looks, uh, looks at uh, foreign leaders like Merkel or um, uh, Macron, uh, it's a, some sort of a contempt because uh, who are you? You, uh, you, come, you? you all guys come and go, I'm still here. I'm a multi-billionaire. I control more money than you can even count. And uh, so you're there, I have to talk to you, but you're weak. So uh, by the way, the way he speaks to Xi Jinping, very different, very different body language. That's the, that's a, like, you know, this is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bigger, it's a bigger fish, you know, bigger predator, yeah. It's, um, but with Trump is, is something else. The, the way he looks at Trump, you know, and his face, it's some kind of, you know, just, you know, green, it's, it's this grinning smile. It's, it's more like a, the handler looks at his ass. That's the, it, maybe it's Trump is an idiot, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm more cynical. And I get people say, oh, Gary, Gary, you know, you, you have, you're Russian, you are, you know, you have a conspiratorial mind. Uh, you know, um, there are many coincidences that you try to, you know, build in a conspiracy theory. I always say, yes, I believe in coincidences, but I also believe in KGB. Let's bring it to Hong Kong. Um... Now, you wrote up again in your, your book about the protests, but you followed the, national, the introduction of the national security law. Yeah. I wanted to ask you a question. If you were a young pro-democracy activist in Hong Kong now, okay, um, given the new law and the consequences that your actions could bring down on your head, basically, what would you do? What would the young activist Gary Kasparov in Hong Kong do? I mean, would you give up the fight, focus in your chest, keep your head down? Would you continue the fight and risk jail, which could also mean jail in mainland China, or would you go into exile, which I think was not an option for you in the Soviet era, but if you were in this situation, and you've read, you know these activists, I'm sure you've met them, what would you do? Look, uh, yeah, no, um... There are no easy ways of making parallels between uh, different times, different countries. I was spared from this very difficult choice because I, um, I was engaged in my you know, chess fights. I was a rising star. And when I had to make these choices, Gorbachev was in power. The Soviet Union was already um, um, uh, not collapsing, but moving in the opposite direction. So that they they didn't feel that they, they, they could afford to, to, to uh, prosecute uh, the rising star, especially when I won, won the title. So I, I, uh, I always had this kind of protection so behind me. 
Um, by the way, in Putin's Russia, it uh, it didn't work out. So I, I knew I knew the potential cost. But when I recognized that um, it would be jail or worse, I left Russia. So I I cannot I don't believe that we're in the position to give any advice to people who are taking such a grave risk. And uh, the way things are unfolding in Hong Kong, and the way the Chinese leadership uh, has been behaving lately. I don't think they will stop short of, of uh, uh, imposing the most draconian laws and, and, and most se severe punishment on those who are opposing. Look, this is the regime that has been conducting genocide in Xinjiang, genocide. So um, uh, in, at a time where the free world is, is, is head, it's, uh, headless, America is not a real player and Trump's big statements against China, they, it's, it's probably more, you know, just politically motivated, but I don't believe for a second that Trump, who showed his admiration for dictators and for Xi Jinping, and as we know from John Bolton, approved uh, the, the Chinese treatment of the Uyghurs. I don't believe that, you know, if, if re-elected Trump would continue the same, the same fight. Um, so it's, it's a personal choice, but I think the consequences will be, will be dire and, and, and the gravest. So right now, I think it's the, the Hong, Kong, uh, Hong Kong and the current political situation, both in China and outside of China is doomed. And uh, it's, it's tragic, but, but they, they, look, we saw what's happening in, in Minsk in Belarus, for instance, now. And it's, that's yeah. not, you know, that's yeah. not- I have a, Gary- Yeah, that's, a yeah this is, it's even there, dictator is trying to cling to yeah. power and, and, and Lukashenko is now definitely facing opposition of 80% of, of, of his own people. And the entire Europe is just, you know, uh, it's, it's looking at him, uh, you know, uh, d d with sign of disapproval and sanctions are being imposed. So my, my prediction for Hong Kong, um, even I'm incorrigible optimist by nature, a long term, I believe that China will also be free, but now we are just, you know, at the time of darkness. I have a question from, um, it, it slightly follows on, but it was a question from Richard Ward, basically just following up, saying, as an emigre yourself, would you advise pro-democracy activists in Hong Kong to emigrate? That's a simple kind of follow-up. Okay, it's the, it's the uh, prominent people uh, who just, you know, who believe that they can play the role in, in, in rebuilding Hong Kong. I would say probably it's, it's, it's a wise choice because you-, you Look, it's, they, China, China, Chinese regime is not at the stage where they care about creating martyrs. And uh, you stay there, you fight, you'll be in jail. You mentioned mainland China, maybe you'll die. So uh, I think it's important that the core of this group is preserved because there will be a moment, maybe sooner than we think, because it's this, this, this as we can see in Belarus, these regimes are not stable and Putin now is experiencing great problems. Hopefully now, when you see this, the trend is going back to the to the eighties. Yeah, uh, it's like a, like a pendulum of history. When we when we have a new wave of pro democracy movements uh, uh, around the world, and when we'll see that these these dictatorships are losing this the um, uh, this the uh, the momentum that unfortunately they have gained in in the geopolitical stage, then I wish there would be enough people in Hong Kong to come back and. Again, God knows, maybe they will eventually argue for an independence. Yeah, why it should the, the Hong Kong is not doomed to be part of China. Maybe they should look for that, I don't know. But clearly, you know, Hong Kong, you know, was a unique place. And, uh, and the whole story, sad story of Hong Kong, shows the difference between democracy and democratic institutions and totalitarian state, because Maggie Thatcher's administration respected decision, uh, an agreement signed by I mean, God knows whom, you know, what's the Lord Cecil, the, the, what was the government, uh, the, the Tory government at, at the late uh, 19th century that signed this, signed this treaty with, with Chinese imperial government. So there were so many ways for, for, for Britain to basically renege on it, saying it was, not, it was a different China. By the way, Chinese, Chinese uh, communist regime never accepted, you know, this is the, the uh, obligations of the pre, you know, Chiang, Chiang Kai-shi or, or imperial China. So there were many ways to actually to to to, to walk away. Just you know, the, to uh, there was so much wriggle room. But again, the, the the signature of one British prime minister was 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 a must for another British prime minister. And China, 
the moment they thought it was the, the this 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 agreement, uh, this treaty was was standing on their way, they threw it, you know, in 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 the, in the dustbin. So that tells you know that any attempt to actually have a long-standing relations with dictatorships, it's the it, it's it's a recipe for the, for failure because they they don't respect the, even the signatures of their own if they feel they they, they can get benefits uh, uh, by 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 walking away from. It. Uh, I, I have two questions from Christy Lou Stout, who's a CNN anchor. Um, the first one is you know following up. How do you see Belarus? I mean, Lukashenko, we phoned Putin, he appeared with his gun. I think it didn't have any bullets in it, but what's going to happen there? Look, you know, what we're seeing in Belarus is somehow it's, it's, it's resembles situation in Venezuela and Syria. And we always have Putin as the, as the key player behind the stage. Because we all thought, okay, it's this, if you have one million people in the streets of Russia, you know, the regime will collapse. If we have enough people protesting, the nonviolent protest can actually topple any dictatorship. So, yes, but what we saw in Syria, what we saw in Venezuela, and what we're seeing in Belarus now proves, uh, proves uh, the opposite. Because it's not about number of people, it's about dictatorship, dictatorships ready or not ready to spill blood and to impose the most draconian measures against the protesters. In Lukashenko's Belarus, we know that 80% of the country, if not more, against him. Even in his staged elections, he lost so badly. So that's the people now are no, no longer afraid of being a minority of, of protesters. They know that four out of five citizens of Belarus are against Lukashenko. And we could see this balance in the streets. But having Putin behind him, uh, Lukashenko doesn't care. And he demonstrates his willingness to go as far as it takes to stay in power. The same way Maduro did, who also probably has 80% of the population against him, but he doesn't care. The dictatorship is willing to, 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 to fight and, and, and shoot, and uh, people on the streets, they, they try to be nonviolent. So um, I don't have a simple answer because at the end of the day, it's probably not just about number of people on the street, but also the number of this number, the percentage of these people who are willing to take stand and fight back, like Maidan. Ukraine and Maidan, by the way, happened in a country that was really divided. Unlike Belarus, Ukraine was divided. But because they had a core group that was willing to fight back, it's, it led to cracks in the regime. So um, um, I, I think that Lukashenko may not survive for too long because the numbers are overwhelmingly against him. And this is not Venezuela, uh, it's not Syria, it's Europe. And um, it's the, there are many ways uh, uh, of, of Europeans to influence it. There are many uh, common borders with Lithuania, with Poland. So you can definitely shift help and the, the, the activists can escape you know, uh, in the neighboring countries. So I think the, the geographical contest and also the, the geopolitical uh, 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 um, uh, contest is not as um, context, is not as favorable to Lukashenko as the other dictators, but uh, make no mistake, he's not going, he's not walking away voluntarily. Okay. I have a question from Peter Bozar. I hope I pronounced his name right. Slight change of country. How do you see Britain at the moment? The British democratic system and political style of Boris Johnson. And he also says, I don't know if you're a big watcher of the BBC. What do you think of the BBC's coverage of it? Uh, I'm... I have to say that you know uh, I, I read about BBC reports, but I'm not watching BBC. So I, I, I'm in Croatia now, but you know I, I reside in the United States, so this is my prime interest. So uh, I follow I follow Britain. Look, I, I I'm familiar with European politics. I think it was you know it was uh, it was very unfortunate that at the time of of Brexit, when Brexit happened, uh, you know the uh, the opposition party Labour was led by Jeremy Corbyn who um, uh, I believe, you know, was uh, secretly celebrating Brexit because that was the greatest, you know, triumph for unreformed socialists, you know, to destroy British Empire. So this is to, because he could think about, you know, further separation of, of uh, um, British Isles, you know, with Scotland potentially walking away. So that's the, uh, and uh, we remember that he, 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 he was running a very, very tepid campaign uh, just against Brexit, just, uh, uh, and the same, you know, could be said about the, uh, the conservatives led by 
by by Cameron, who was not uh, who was not again the, the, the fierce campaigner. So, it's the, um, and uh, um, it's it's quite tragic that you know the the uh, the the decisions supported clearly by a minority uh, of the country, uh, you know, led Britain to to this uh, to this political turmoil, and uh, somehow the. Um, the appearance and, and the rise of Boris Johnson was inevitable because he, he proved to be the only politician to to operate, you know, who felt comfortable operating in in, in this in this in this environment. And um, the only good thing about Johnson's, you know, Johnson's uh, um, uh, um, stay in power that is it's it forced Labour to change because I I'm a bit more comfortable now because Labour has a decent leadership, real people that are looking for, you know, for um, uh, uh, repairing the damage caused by this by the split between Brexiteers and far left uh, labor, uh, but I don't know what will happen with 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 Britain you now sailing in this ocean of uncertainty because now uh, it's it has to find you know its 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 spot and um, it's it's tough but I think it's 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 uh, it's not it's wrong to actually separate Britain uh, and British Isles from the rest of the world it's. It's a part of the global turmoil. You have Trump in America. You had the Brexit in Europe, in in, in 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 Britain. You have the European countries that also, you know, was struggling with uh, even pre-COVID-19, struggling with the uh, refugees problems, uh, ref the flood of refugees, and the rise of the far right and 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 uh, mostly far right, but also far left. So it's um it's 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 a, it's a global challenge, and I think it's it's what is needed now is is a vision for the future. I think democracy. Is failing to offer, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's the vision of next five or ten years. It's all about what happens now. We we became very reactive instead of being proactive and 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 offering people, especially young people, some kind of you know uh, optimistic and bright vision of the future. What countries are the are doing well? What are the model countries at the moment for democracy? Would you say? Well. I don't know. I just I I'm, I'm afraid that I mean there's just uh, probably we should go as far as Australia and New Zealand. But the moment I say that, I'm sure we'll hear you know comments <laughs> yes, because I'm reading also about you know Australian problems. You know the government that is being harshly criticised for its uh, um, for its very uh, um, sort of anti-environmental policies. So look, the it's a as in the 80s we saw the crisis of the communist system and totalitarian regimes. Now we are going through this political turmoil in the free world, uh, and unless these the the uh, the there's a, like exit for all of us, it, not exit strategy, but it's basically it's exit from from this state of affairs into something in, into a new chapter of the free world. It will be it will be possible to have one country that is doing better than others. Today it could be one country, tomorrow another country, but at the end of the day, unless America gets its act together. Unless America, you know, just uh, uh, regain its its leadership role, I don't think anything is going to happen. With all due respect to other countries, to the European Union, it's America's responsibility to 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 lead, and it's right. We, we know it's not happening now, and America should you know, should definitely clean its house first, uh, starting with you know with a big house uh, on 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Okay. Well, it seems a bit crazy that we've been talking for almost an hour and we haven't been, we haven't really discussed chess. So let's uh, I'll share a couple well, of. You know, you know what? You know, as I said, <laughs> I always said, people when people ask me about chess, uh, all the way back in two thousand five when I stopped, you know, uh, playing chess and moved into this, you know, muddy waters of politics. And I said, look, you know, in Russia, you know, playing chess didn't help me much because in chess we have fixed rules and unpredictable results. And in Putin's Russia or in any other dictatorship. So the, the um, result stays the same, but rules change all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Your foundation is, you promote educating, in education, yeah. children learning chess. And um, I don't want to misquote you, but I think you, on your website, you said to help kids meet the challenge of the modern globalized world. That's what, so yes. what, what value does chess bring to young people or to, it, to anybody who plays it? Oh, uh, no, let's let's stick with with kids because now um, I think the educational system as a whole needs uh, uh, needs uh, um, very comprehensive, I would say, 
drastic reform because it's it's a system that people some people argue say oh it's it's too uh, it's too conservative by its nature and uh, and uh, uh, changing it is too risky. My answer is that's not changing it, not reforming it. It's much riskier because the education system is built to prepare kids for the future lives. And now we're still, you know, working with the same algorithm as in the middle of the 19th century. So the time traveler from that, from that period would not recognize any, any element of our world today except the classroom. It's still, it's still the same. And we still have the teacher as a center of authority and, and the sort of the uh, main uh, um, source of information. At a time where kids, you know, can swipe their finger on the screen and just get all the data they need. So I think it's the education today has to shift from teaching kids what to teaching them how. It's about preparing them to apply the knowledge that they can collect elsewhere. And that's what chess can help because it's about developing their cognitive skills. It's about understanding how the big picture works. And the big picture, you know, means that you do something on one side of the board and it affects, you know, uh, uh, the events on the other side of the board. And uh, um, uh, well, in, in life, it's, it's, it's about applying the knowledge that you collected here elsewhere. Um, and uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a universal recipe because there should be, should be many elements like the game of chess that could actually help kids to adjust to these new challenges. Because to teach them about something that may become irrelevant five years from now, it's just, I see no point. Uh, the jobs that these kids will cover in 15 years, most of these jobs don't exist today. They will, and why should we you know, spend our time predicting them? It's all about preparing kids for these challenges, for ever-changing situation. And I think chess here, you know, uh, works, works just fine. In deep thinking, I think, would it be fair to say, I mean, a lot of people are fearful of artificial intelligence. And I mean, we can make the connection back to deep blue. But I think you're very positive on it. Could you, I know we're just, a, it's a big topic to ask you at the end, but. Yeah. Uh, Look, I'm, I'm, I'm positive because as I already said, I'm incorrigible optimist by nature. And uh, uh, I just believe that, you know, the, the machines, uh, machines rise is inevitable, but it's not as our competitors. It's, it's for us to understand that, you know, we could, we could greatly benefit from that. It's about understanding how this collaboration works. Um, that's why I always prefer to call AI not artificial intelligence, but augmented intelligence, because it's about human, human machine collaboration. And I think that these this, this machines will not make us obsolete. They will you know, make, make us stronger, smarter, so we, we can be promoted. Because if you look at the, at the structure of the job markets today, and by the way, uh, pandemics somehow helped us to understand it. So uh, for generations, we have been teaching people to act like machines. And all of a sudden, you know, we, you know it's, it, it's all, it, all these jobs become redundant and people are complaining that these jobs are in danger. So by McKinsey's uh, uh, study, uh, only 4% of working time in America require uh, medium human creativity, 4%. That means 96% of all, all, all the works, uh, now uh, work, working time, you know, it's, it's like, you know, jo the jobs that are dead. It's like zomb zombie jobs. They dead, they just, they just don't know they're dead already. So I think it's the, 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 the future development and I can emphasize again that pandemic is helping us to understand it. It's about understanding how we can, you know, get maximum benefits out of that because machines are there. And, and by the way, uh, would you mind having driverless cars now on the streets at the time of pandemic? Would you, like, would you mind having robots, you know, in the hospitals or in the restaurants? So somehow we understand there's some be the, the benefits. And yes, many jobs will, will be in danger. And I don't want to sound callous, but that's, you know, that's the history of civilization. You know, it's the, uh, the, the, some jobs always disappear with new machines, but new jobs will be created. And instead of, you know, instead of uh, crying over spilled milk, over the jobs that already, you know, lost or, or, or being lost, we should look into the future thinking how we can create new jobs using these almost unlimited, you know, possibilities. Every one of us, you know, right now, just looking at the screen of a device that is 10,000 times more powerful than, um, than the, the, the combined NASA 
computing power in 1969 when America's landed on the moon. So, and, and ask, ask a simple question, are we using it effectively or we just, you know, we, we, we waste 99.9% of this power? Thank you. And final question from Judy Schneider, sitting beside me, president of the club. Uh, what's your summer reading, Gary, during this pandemic? What are you reading? <laughs> oh, well, just as this, I have to say that is just, you know, I, uh, I, um, uh, right now, actually, I'm not reading, actually, I'm finishing, you know, uh, reading, uh, uh, listening to Stephen Fry's, you know, the mythos and heroes, you know, that's, that's, uh, I love it. And as I, I, uh, um, um, I um, read a book, Good Omens, and I actually did, did, did uh, it's, it's also followed the, the series on Amazon, and I did even a book club on that. Um, and uh, um, I'm now, uh, right now I'm reading, um, 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 finishing Winston Churchill of Andrew Roberts, and also, it's, that's it's my, my biggest hero, and I'm also re uh, reading now the Churchill's, uh, also, I said reading, I'm, just it's all audio, audio book of listening to Churchill's uh, best quotes and speeches. Uh, but I read, I read, I read all the time. So that's why I just I right. said the this this the books that are already on my Kindle or on my on my audio. But it's just you know it's the there are there are a few other few other books and and uh, that are always you know come. It's, it's like you know it's an ongoing process of consuming right. information. Right. Well, that was fascinating. Thank you very much. We're delighted Thank to you. host you. And I hope the next time we can host you in person when the world returns to oh, some. Oh, OK. Yes, uh, I think that uh, Hong Kong might not be on my travel, on my travel <laughs> uh, uh, at least. I mean, first of all, these days we don't travel. And mm -hmm. uh, even if the pandemic is over, I, uh, I doubt very much that in the foreseeable future, I'll be able to set my foot on Chinese, uh, Chinese soil. Mm -hmm. Or, or the soil it. controlled by Chinese Communist Party, uh, because I, I, I'll, be, I'll, I'll be delighted to go to ta ta Taiwan, for instance. Okay, Gary Kasparov, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye bye.